You are now listening to The True Light with As Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. You know, my grandmother sends money to these guys you know, on the radio, and they send her these cloths and things saying that they could make her better. And I want to know if you can really do that through the radio. She put her hand on it or touch it, or can these things that people send in the mail, is it true that they can heal them with that? That sort of thing. That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. Because today we have a lot of people who are wolves in sheep's clothing. They've gone out amongst the flocks of faithful people and they're just robbing them. They're robbing hooding people. They're ripping them off as you would have it in your language. They say they're spreading the gospel of the Most High, whether they're saying that they are Pentecostal or that they belong to the Jehovah Witness or even if they call themselves the nation of Islam in the beginning of all of their lectures and the end of all of their lectures it's all based on money we're supposed to be teaching the word of the most high if you say you're following the messiah Jesus the son of Mary who was called the son of the most high then follow him and follow in his pattern Jesus fed the multitudes he multiplied the loaves of bread and the fish he didn't go around taking. He didn't have after the sermon on the mount, we tell people to raise their hands because they're going to pledge a certain amount of money. He didn't have people coming down to the front of the altar kissing his hand. He didn't have people's grandmothers. I'm speaking about old women and old men who are caught up on faith and caught up on the Holy Spirit and their belief in the Most High. He didn't have them giving their last penny into some preacher who's driving around in a Cadillac. We tie those, those false preachers and those false teachers. And I'm talking about in Islam too. We tie you so-called Sunni Muslims walking around America, you American Negroes, and you're over there in the Arab world begging them up for money all the time and then pointing to the Ansar Allah community and call people who are out selling oils and incense so that they can afford to go on the air without begging all the time and you call us the beggars. And you're really over there working for the white man who calls himself an Arab. Here you are saying that you're so devoted to America, like word of D. Muhammad, so devoted to America, yet he's on a bankroll of Saudi Arabia, as they say. We're tired of you people pretending. You got these Sunni Muslims who are always talking about the Ansar Allah community being beggars, and they're all over the world begging people, begging white Arabs to give them something for nothing because they don't want to do a very simple thing. 
work in the name of themselves. Allah Ta'ala says you take one step towards him, he'll take ten towards you. Obviously you people ain't taking no steps because you're not progressing. But that's not the point of this discussion and the answer to your question. No, it is not possible for anybody, your grandmother, to put a foot on a radio and get healed by some faith healer. There's no such thing. Even Jesus made it very clear in the books of Matthew 15 that the woman of the Canaanite tribe that came out of Sidon, that cursed woman, healed herself by what she believed. Jesus told people that they healed himself. He said, I am my own accord can do nothing. I am not greater than he who sent me. As I hear from the Lord, I speak. And everything that I say comes from the Lord. So no, Jesus did not himself really heal anybody. He healed everybody in the name of the Father. So no Christian preacher can have you by sending you some prayer cloth that he touched. Who does he think he is that he can touch a prayer cloth and it can heal you? Let me tell you, my grandmothers and my grandfathers out there in the audience, it's your faith that makes you whole. It's your faith that heals you. None of these four preachers and none of these four teachers can heal you if you don't have faith in the most. High. And please stop sending these people to these, on these radio stations your money. Stop sending them your money. Our grandmothers and our grandfathers who receive social security and social service and welfare, whatever have you, need their pennies. And you preachers that be on the radio begging for money all the time ought to be ashamed of yourselves that you're out there begging these old people for money and don't care the conditions they're living in. The old people in this country are living in some of the worst conditions and they're going to churches and people are passing out buckets and ripping them off for pennies and nickels and dimes that they need. I'm calling you again. I'm telling you, please stop robbing our grandmothers and our grandfathers of their life earnings just to support your Cadillac and your driving up and down the Jersey Turnpike pretending that you are a savior. Please, I want you elders who are listening to me to stop sending in your money to these people. If they're really working in the way of the Lord, they will be protected and provided for because he is a provider. He will see that they have. And if they're out to spread the gospel, Jesus did not go around begging up money. And the answer of our community as quiet as kept as they keep saying, does not beg money. As you see them, brothers, you see them with pamphlets and pamphlets, and every week they got a new pamphlet out. Them pamphlets are produced by the people here from all that you do. But we are not coming on the air here telling you to send us money. And any preacher that asks you to send them some money and tell them at least, when you speak about Herbert W. Armstrong, at least he was supplying the world with a bunch of free pamphlets, not no one 12-page leaflet that don't cost nothing when you get it as a million copies. And then he's ripping off millions of dollars and telling people to pledge this and pledge that. Watch these people who call themselves so moral. They are the most immoral people we have out there. They're by far the majority. And you better watch these people talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. And most of them have ain't got no Holy Ghost. They run up and down the stage and dance and sing because some of their cousins are professional singers. So they learned how to act on the stage from a childhood just idolizing their rock and roll or country western singing. The biggest hypocrites you have. And I repeat, please... Please stop supporting these Christian preachers over the radio who is asking you for money. Please stop. Stop taking the money of our elders. They need their money to survive. Okay, I saw in Genesis where, um, where the, I call him the Creator now because I don't know what, you know, I don't call him God, I don't call him, you know, Jehovah. Allah? Allah? You don't call him Allah? No, because I'm not going to call it unless I really understand. It. I don't want to, you know, be a hypocrite. Well, like let that. me help you understand it. Then right. you can tell me about Genesis. Breathe in. Uh huh. Breathe in. I got that. A lot. Got it. When you say it. When you come out, it comes out a lot. Wait a minute. Now, say God and breathe in. <sighs> can you do it? No. Nah. Say Jehovah and breathe in. Jehovah. <laughs> can you do it? No, nah, you can't do it. Say Yahweh and breathe in. Yahweh. <laughs> Say bow. Say what? Bow. That's another God. What is it? Bow. Bow. Can you do it? No. Say Krishna. Krishna. Say Christ. Christ. <laughs> Say Allah. Oh. You can do it, huh? Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, in the scriptures, uh -huh. in Genesis, like you said, yes. the heavenly Father said, "I blew, I blew like into man uh -huh. of my spirit, and man became a living soul." Right. But the statement is into. I put my spirit in man. That means from the outside it travels inward, the name of the Heavenly Father. Uh -huh. You were not able to do that with any other name but Allah. Right. So therefore, it couldn't have been God or Je Jehovah or Christ. It had to be 
Allah is not a name. Allah is describing the very breath of life you breathe. Uh -huh. Allah has names, he says. <laughs> His name is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Qudus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'minu, Al-Muhaymin, Al-Aziz, Al-Jibar, Al-Mutakabir, Al-Khaliq, Al-Bari, Ila Al-Akhra, Ila Tisat Asr, Ila Tisayin, to 90 names, uh -huh. and 99. But Allah is merely the breath, it's breathing. And if a person denies the existence and power of Allah, tell them they cannot do it for more than five minutes. Yeah. And if you don't, if you think you can, anybody in that room, stop breathing and let's see. I bet you, within five minutes, you'll be calling on the name of Allah. You'll be going, <laughs> and you won't realize you're saying Allah, but you'll be going, <laughs> when a baby is born, what does it do? Does it say God? Nope. No baby comes out going, God, God, God. They learn to say, gimme, 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 but they don't say, God, God. They say what? They say Allah. They say, yeah. ah. If a person ah, falls from a high place on his way down, does he go, God? He goes, God. Poof. No, they go, ah. You know what's strange about that? When Jesus, the Messiah, according to the Christian, was on the cross, according to the Christian, he didn't say Jehovah either. They say, he said, Eli, Eli. He went back to I, I also. Throughout the whole Bible, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists use Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. But when they get to the section in the Bible where it says Jesus was on the cross, he says, Eli, Eli, lama <laughs> Because they never say, in the Bible, it never says that Jesus actually said Jehovah, right? No, they don't. But he never did. I guess they can make, you know, you can make, they can make some lies, but some they just don't have, you know, some they just can't make. I well, they, they're selling a religion that sells products and they sell more crosses and Bibles than anything, any other book and piece of jewelry in the whole world. The Christians are in business. That's what people got to realize. The Christian, Christianity is a business. It's not a religion. And if you ask a Christian what is his religion, he can't tell you. Walk up to a Christian and say, what's your religion? You say, Christianity. Say, I didn't ask you the name of the founder of it. I asked you, what is your religion? Christianity. No, no, no. That's the name of the founder of it. What is it? <laughs> they can't say because it's not a religion. It's, it's a political organization. It's a business. It sells war, and it sells propaganda, and it sells lies, and it sells parties, and it sells fake marriage ceremonies, and it sells all kinds of stuff. But it doesn't teach religion. Okay, in, in Genesis, um, the Creator told, told the serpent, after he had to do Eve, the Creator told him that he would be the lowest of all creatures. He told him that he would um, put an enmity between him and woman. And that, that, that means, does that mean something like he would make them an enemy or something to each other? I no, the know. word is hostility. It's hostility. enmity. Right. Which means hostility right. between them. You have to go on to really read that. You pick the Bible up and see where it says that so you can understand it. Uh -huh. That's chapter, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Yeah. It says, and I will put enmity, hostility, uh -huh. between thee, meaning right. who? The meaning of meaning the, the servant. servant. And the woman, meaning Eve. Right. And between your seed, meaning the serpent was going to have an offspring, the seed and her seed, meaning a woman was going to have children. So the serpent was destined to have a seed, a nasala in Hebrew or in Arabic, mm -hmm. which meant the serpent was going to have an offspring and this woman was going to have a seed. Well, you being a son and daughter of Adam, you're the seed of this woman. Right. Who is the seed of the serpent that they spoke about here, which what everybody is, seems to avoid? Is it the Canaanite? Right, the, the white race. <laughs> right. Because All right, but let me finish what it goes on. I know, I'm trying to get to the point you want. Okay. Right? Yeah. Now, it says, it shall bruise thy head. What is the it? The, the enmity or the hostility, the hostility yeah. is going to be result of bruise, which is going to cause you to bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we switch from her to his. You follow that? Uh -huh. It's the hostility that the white man has that's going to be his own downfall. Many occasions you have walked into an establishment for business of a white person. Uh -huh. And you know what they did? They asked you what you want. Can I help you? Yeah. They have no idea how much money you plan to spend. They have no, they don't, all they see is a black person, and right away, hostility sets in, and they start questioning you. Yeah, that's right. What can I do for you? Or they got somebody following you around the store. And you finally get mad and say, forget it, and you walk out and spend your money somewhere else. The white man's hostility and his jealousy and his evilness is going to be his own downfall. That's right, because, you know, I have a, um, I have to go over cleaning for my father. And when I went to the supply store that he gave the supplies from for the first time, I went there for the first time, they didn't know me. So I'm buying supplies and picking up stuff, and they looking at me, the white button asking me, you know, what do I want, this and that. 
Then when I show them my father's check, and I, then they recognize them, uh -huh. then they start being nice. But I said, what is it about me, the way I look then, that didn't make me seem to be a kind of person that could be buying something? Your face is not on the dollar bill, that's why. Right. <laughs> the moment you see a black face on the dollar bill, then white is going to have another whole outlook on black people. Yeah. I got one more question on that. About in Leviticus, I was reading where, um, where they said that you can have a, a leprosy, you can have a form of leprosy where it'll cover your whole body, your whole body will turn white, and then you'll be pronounced clean. That's is right. That like a, is that saying that, okay, a white person... You're talking about, Re in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 is what right. they're talking about, for people that are listening. Yeah, because I didn't know the exact person. Is that, is that saying that a white person is, he can be a, he's a clean leper? In it means words? that he is not one who has the contagious disease of leprosy. Because right. the white man will say, I'm not a leper, and he's talking about those things that they lock up on islands, who have a, a, a type of leprosy where their flesh is deteriorating right in front of your face. But when a white man calls himself a caucus Asian, a ca caucus means dead, dead flesh or deteriorating flesh. When he calls himself caucus or caucus Asian, he's admitting to the disease of leprosy. When you see liver spots and all the different things that play up on him, that's leprosy. But if there are certain Europeans who don't get liver spots, but they're white all over. Yeah. They are clean lepers. You follow? Right. But you still can't marry them. It said the priest would still lock them up for seven days and wait to see if the rawness of the flesh would break out in their sin. Uh -huh. You follow? So there are a such thing as clean lepers. And those are the ones you see that don't have the contagious disease where like Robert Grimsby that comes on the news whose forehead is falling off right in front of everybody on national television. His skin peeling right off his face. Those people there are, they are what they call unclean lepers. Then there are those that you can shake hands with and not catch leprosy, but if you lay with them in their genes because of generations, there's leprosy. Mm. So that's what the books of Leviticus is saying. Yes, there are certain ones that the priests looked at and saw that they, were, they didn't have raw sores and raw flesh. And when you're on your way back home today, be it by any form of public transportation, now sit down and look at white people and watch them fall apart. They're just falling apart physically right in front of you. It's a dangerous thing to get on the train. You don't realize now you can catch AIDS if someone sneezes? And if they sneeze and you have your mouth closed and it goes in your eye, you can catch it. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? Yes. I got to die because he, did, because he wanted to lay up with animals in the cave. That's, that's something. I got to catch syphilis because he wanted to lay up with animals and gonorrhea and herpes because he was having sex with animals while living in the cave. He brings these diseases and now brings you out of, out of Africa and brings you here and now spreads the diseases and then goes over there and spreads the diseases over there so he can use it as a testing field. Okay. Now he's saying that he's getting all the, the, the AIDS is spreading throughout Africa. That's because he needs some people to experiment on. So he's taking it over there and injecting it in people. The worst thing you can do is go get an examination from a white man who says, what do you think will come in here and let me see if you got AIDS? Yep, he got AIDS. Yeah, because um, they say, cause, um, the Africans that were brought over, they said that they had absolutely no vanilla diseases, right? None. None at all. None whatsoever. A black man in America hasn't bred any venereal diseases. And if any of those diseases had come out of Africa, y'all would have become distinct by now. Y'all caught them diseases laying up with white women. People throughout the Caribbean are aspiring to get a white wife. All throughout Africa, all the kings are trying to get British and, and German wives, and they breed that right into their genes. Well, we're our own worst enemies. Allah tells us in the Quran, I made you into tribes and families that you ain't know about each other. If, he, if, if everybody in the world mixes, that's going to become a contradiction. Another generation from now, if everybody intermarries, then there'll be a contradiction, you know. You won't be able to read that section in the Quran as a fact, because there won't be no tribes and families. Everybody will be one mixed race. So Allah never intended for everybody to intermarry, just because He said, I made you in the tribes of family, and the best amongst you is He was the most righteous. Every man was created from a single male and female, has nothing whatsoever to do with integration. Because yeah, I read where um, he, told, he told Abraham that his seed would be the, um, would be, well, chosen or whatever. And that, right. means, that, that means race only, right? That means your seed, yeah, that's right. So that means that Abraham, okay, say Abraham's seed. Yes. Abraham we, had three sons. Right. Well, he had, more, he had, he had uh, three uh, progenitors of, of nationality. The Ishmaelites, uh -huh. the Israelites, right. and the Midianites. Because okay. Midian, through Ketorah, Nimrod's daughter, he had six sons by her alone. But Midian was the one where Jethro came out of, and the prophet Luchman. Right. So that means that, that, that through today, that his seed are the people that, that have... You are his seed. You're Abraham's Abraham right, seed. Right. You just got a little mixed up along the way. Right. But, but, the, you, but you, you prayed hard enough and now the truth has come. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is, my question that I have is on the crucifixion. Uh, the Christians put forth that Jesus was crucified on the cross. What is the Islamic interpretation of the crucifixion? 
Well, I don't. Before I give the Islamic interpretation of it, um, do you know what Christian did that? What Christian did that to you? Which Christian did that to you? Because you said the Christian. Which Christian? I, I'm just stating Christians in general. Um, you know, Are you a Christian? No, I'm, okay. I, I don't consider myself a Christian. No. See, because it's important because the Jehovah Witness have one interpretation of what took place on the cross. The Seventh Day Adventists have another. The Catholics have another. Now, what the Muslims read is that Allah says that Jesus was not solid nor taqila. Two words. The word solid means to be laid on a cross, crucified. And taqila means to be killed. It said he was not crucified, nor did they kill him. You see that? Which meant that in Islam, according to the Quran, Jesus never ever was on the cross. I know we have certain people out there from the outer world like Ahmadida and different ones who are writing books from our books and then all to them the suit and say that Jesus was taken down off the cross alive. They got that from the Talmud, from Jewish writings, not even from the Torah. Correct? But in the correct view of Islam, the Messiah Jesus, the son of Mary, never was crucified and never was even on a cross. Ever. According to follow that? Then if we want to address this, a variety of proof pertaining to the Bible, there's so many contradictions in relation to the story. I mean, the man on the cross told somebody he would be in heaven with him today. According to the other prophecy, he was supposed to be in the bowels of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, if you're going to be in heaven today, you can't be in the earth for three days and three nights. They also say that Jesus was supposed to resurrect spiritually. If Jesus was going to resurrect spiritually, then they had no reason to move the stone physically because the spirit can penetrate a the stone. They said a man who was on the cross said, I'm thirsty. Jesus brought Lazarus back to life from the dead after being dehydrated or rigor mortis having set in for three days. After 48 hours, you know rigor mortis sets in, the body begins to dehydrate. He put flesh, blood, water, bone, plasma, and tissues back together. This man going to get on the cross and say, I'm thirsty after he said my things are not of this world. The man on the cross said, Father, why have thou forsaken me? The Christians say that when Jesus was 13 years old, he told his mother and father, I must be about my father's work. So how can you be forsaken about some work that ain't even yours? There's a million little things that you can touch on that you'll find out that they just lied. And you won't find that in the original language, Jesus was crucified. That is a part of that political religion, I said, that they created to control people. The Romans and the reformed Jews of Jesus' time, I mentioned reform, but they wasn't following the law, right? They got together and fabricated this doctrine. You see that? Yeah, um, one last question. Um, why is it so hard for, uh, again, the so-called Christians, in particular sect of Christians, uh, the so-called Jehovah Witness, who seems like they say they reject Christendom, it seems like they're stones throw away from accepting uh, Islam, but yet they reject everything what they say is Christian because they don't deal with Christendom. But I, my question again is, why is it so hard for those who set the last prophet, Prophet Muhammad? Because what the Jehovah Witnesses have going against them is them, they have their own Bible. <laughs> and then they wrote the books to match their Bible. So they think they're right. As long as you're quoting your own Bible and you wrote your Bible to match your book, I mean, how can you go wrong? So when you reach them, you can't point out little points in the Bible where it says that Jesus said that they're going to put his disciples out of the synagogue. Correct? In a lot of days, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Now, if Jesus' disciples were being told that they were going to be put out of the synagogue, if this is in uh, uh, St. John chapter 16, you all have that? Turn to St. John chapter 16. And it's supposed to be Jesus speaking. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. What's the next verse say? They shall put you out of the synagogue. Correct? Correct? Does the whole witnesses go to a synagogue? Do seven day Adventists go to a synagogue? Who goes to synagogue? Jews, right? So what religion was Jesus talking to when he was talking to these people? What religion were they following? You know who he's talking to in this chapter? He's talking to his own disciples in this chapter here. <laughs> and he's telling his disciples, they're his disciples, and they're going to put y'all out of the synagogue, not out of the churches. <laughs> so Jesus' the disciples were therefore attending synagogue, and therefore must have been what? They were not following Christianity, they must have been Jews. Because the Jehovah's Witness can't see that far, 
They can't even see those little statements like this. This may not seem like it's important to you, but if you say in St. John chapter 15 and 16, this is supposed to be Jesus addressing his, his followers about his return. And before we go any further, let's just jump right on that one spot. He said that y'all were going to be put out of synagogue, which means that his disciples in his time were attending services at synagogue. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. But see, they were following Judaic teachings, not Christianity. So tell them where, anywhere, in Jehovah Witness Bible or Seven Day Adventist Bible or Christian, any Bible, doesn't imply that his followers would be other than Israelites. Right? But he speaks about the bad churches in Revelation and say unto the church of this and to the church of this, because you held not my faith for my father's name. <laughs> He spoke about those bad churches. He spoke about a synagogue that's full with Satan's spirit. I know the blasphemy that will call themselves Jews and are not. But he spoke about people who are saying they are of Jews and are not. They are a synagogue for Satan. He spoke about them too. So he must have thought of his disciples as the righteous ones as opposed to those who were of the unrighteous. You understand? Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Um, what I want to get is an understanding about this. I think before I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that he said if a person kept the Ten Commandments before they knew anything about Islam, that they might make it to paradise. I never said that. You never said that. You know why I never said that? Okay. Because firstly, when Moshe, which is the Hebrew for Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophet Moses, he did not receive Ten Commandments. He received 613 commandments. That you can find in any Jewish encyclopedia. A lot of Christians don't know that. Secondly, the so-called Ten Commandments were Ten Commandments pulled out of the 613 Commandments when the tribes of Israel had settled in the valley and set up the ark of the tabernacle and they were talking only to the tribes of Israel. When they said, Thou shalt not kill, they were talking about each other because the Israelites was out killing everybody else. And if you read the Bible in Exodus, you see that they killed everybody else. They killed people from every other tribe. He said, thou shalt not kill. When he said, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, he was talking about one tribe covering the next tribe. Because as you know, Solomon and them was marrying into other races of people. Right. You follow that? Right. Any one of those commandments you read will pertain directly to the children of Israel in Moses' time while they were in the valley on their way to the land of Canaan. It has nothing to do with this day and time whatsoever. It's talking about rules and regulations to govern the children of Israel when they set up the Ark of the Tabernacle. People have just fallen so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's past until they can't see that. They like these things. Ten Commandments has nothing to do with y'all whatsoever. So I never could have said that. Okay, so, alright, you say the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with us in this day and time. So, which commandments, okay, because like I said, so we're going on Christian doctrine, I'm trying to help other people out and get an understanding. But, which commandments in this day and time do apply? When they ask Jesus, after the children of Israel had perished, what is our greatest of all the commandments, what he said? That you shall serve the Lord thy God, and him alone shall you serve. He said it's the highest commandment. And after him, when Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, what did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? The highest of all commandments is, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahtahu la sharika lahu. Not bear witness that there is only one creator who is Allah and he has no partner. We will return with the true light after this brief intermission. Would you like to see the man behind the voice you hear teaching the total truth? He is there at the Hall of Knowledge located at 548 Hart Street, Brooklyn, New York. Every Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m., the Nubian Islamic Hebrews would like to invite you to question and answer classes with a Sayyid Ali Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. Come listen and learn. Hear the words of truth for yourself. Hear the answers to long-awaited questions. Also for your spiritual growth, an intricate design woven prayer rug designed by the hand of a Sayyid Ali Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. Also available are prayer beads, incense, and oils. If you would like any further information on these items, contact the original tents of Kedar, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. And be sure to ask for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by a Sayyid Ali Marisa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. We, the Nubian Islamic Hebrews, would like to hear from you. Write us and let us know how the true light has made a difference in your life. 
Unlike those fake healers and lying preachers, we are not asking you to send us money for prayer cloths and lucky numbers. We are a self-supporting program. We just ask that you show your support by writing as Saeed El Imam Isa al Mahdi. Let him know how the true light has made a difference in your life. We are asking you don't send your hard-earned money to those lying men who claim to come in the name of Jesus and who really come in the name of themselves. So beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Now let us continue with the true light. Remember, you are the light and you have the power over all things. The highest of all the commandments and the first commandment in every man's heart should be Tawheed, Wahtahu, La Sharika Allahu. Allah is alone and by no partners with Him. Though that is inclusive in the Ten Commandments, that is the highest of all commandments first. You follow that? And then Jesus told them, if they're Christian, the next thing He said, after you establish where your father is at, and how did Jesus establish to them where their father was at? What did He say in the Lord's Prayer? Who knows the Lord's Prayer? Well, He said, Our Father who art in heaven. So now we know according to Jesus where His Father was at. Where did He say He was at? In heaven. That's right. So once we got past Tawheed, Allah, Wahdullah, Sayyidullah, then they say, Hopi, Samawati. He's in the heaven. Not for Al Al Arab. Not He's on the earth. You see? Hopi, Samawati. Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven. Right. Then what did He say? Holy be thy name. That's right, holy, hallowed be thy name. The next thing we got to find out is his proper name. If we go back to the Torah and go back to Hebrew, they use the word Elohim. Elohim is the same thing as Elah, Allah, and the plural, Allahumma. O oh Allah and all of his illustrious attributes. Elohim. So in Bena Israel, when they worship in their language, they use Elohim. Then some will say, no, they use Yahweh or Yahweh or Yahovah, etc. Yahweh or Yahovah is nothing but Yahuwah. Huwa Allah, Elavi, La ilaha, illa huwa. Yahuwah or Jehovah is nothing but a demonstrative of Allah, Huwa, Allah, Hu. So the next thing is to realize, after you realize Tawheed, Allah is alone, then you better establish who you're talking about. And don't get God and Allah mixed up. When I speak to you people, I often tell you God so I can keep your attention. Because I keep you in Allah, you'll miss the significance of it. Not everybody, but most. But don't make the mistake like most so-called Sunni Muslims into believing in Allah and God is the same thing. That's not the translation of Allah in English from Arabic is not God or the God or a God. Allah, la ilaha illa huwa. Allah, there's no creator except He. And the reason why I use Creator as a translation is because Creator is one of His names, al Khaliku. <laughs> because there is no translation of Allah. The reason why I say Life Giver, because one of His names is Al-Hayu, the Living, the Life Giver. Because Allah's name has no translation. So once you get down to the loneliness of Allah, then the next commandment is Our Father who art where? In heaven. What? Next. Holy be thy name. And then the next is to set up the principles in order. Whose kingdom is coming? What did he say then? Thy, thy, thy kingdom come. He didn't say Jesus' kingdom. He didn't say Muhammad's kingdom. He didn't say Moses' king, Moses's kingdom. He didn't say Abraham's kingdom. He said, Thy kingdom come. You understand? Yep. And the next one is what? Thy will be done. And that's it. Thy will be done. When you establish Allah in Tahid, <laughs> where He is, and what He governs, and whose will we should follow, everything else takes place on earth. You see? The Talim of Allah Ta'ala is La ilaha. And it stops right there. La ilaha. Say that. Everybody. La ilaha. Come on, can y'all say that? You know what it means? La, nothing, ilaha, would exist. La, ilaha, nothing, would exist. Illallah. If Allah didn't bring it into existence. At the point of the second part of the calendar, things begin to exist. Allah merely says to a thing, kun, fayakun. 
and he repeats Qun twice for La Ilah. And that's a short word of Allah. La Ilah. Illa except Allah. Then the word becomes flesh. Muhammad Rasulullah. And Muhammad is an apostle of Allah. Isa Rasulullah. Musa Rasulullah. Ibrahim Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. After you get your principles established where Allah is, who Allah is, who Allah is, and what He expects from His creatures, then you interject the prophets. And what they came and how they came, what they came with and how they came to guide you to Isra'at al Mustaqeen. Okay. Okay, um, it's one of the things. I was trying to explain to somebody uh, that, that, the, that the flood they speak of the days of Noah uh, di didn't, I mean, lasted more than 40 days and 40 nights. Because you have these, you know, preachers and pastors that say it only lasted 40 days. And I wonder if you could give me an understanding so I could give it to somebody else who wants to know. I wrote a whole book on it, two volumes. Read the book and it explains it for you. Well, uh, which book is, which book is it? Uh, <laughs> the true story of Noah and the flood, part one and two. Okay. Then that way, when you come back, you can ask me questions of things you didn't understand, as opposed to just start off the top. As I write these books, I ain't gonna ever talk about them again. <laughs> okay. All right. Peace. Yes, so I have a question pertaining to the um, how does Allah speak to the angels? Wait. You know where is? Inspiration. Inspiration. Yes. Allah thinks and they act. Now is it like they hold conversations together or is it That's like... That's not what I said. Listen again. I right. said Allah thinks and they act. Allah, Allah merely... When you're, in a, when you're out of the physical body, see, understand those two things on the side of your head. Right. They're called ears. Right. They're only there for one reason. Right. And one reason only. To control sound and monitor it down and let it bounce off nerve fibers to send tone nation of messages to the brain. Alright? Uh -huh. Without ears, the means of communication will be telepathically. Mm. Telepathy. Angelic beings, when they are in an ethic state of life, which the law says they are, mm -hmm. right? Then, like water, if you want to change its color, you just add something of color into it. You see? Right. If Allah wants to change the mental wavelength of an angelic being, he contemplates on it and sends energy to it and changes the thought pattern. Mm. When angelic beings like Jibrael, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah, the angel, with Gabriel, would come into the human form, then he would inherit a voice box and a tongue and ears so he could speak on a, on a, a level to man. Or he would materialize in the dream of a human being and speak to the person while in their dream. You follow? Is that the same way Allah spoke to Adam? Was it actually... Allah spoke to Adam several different ways. Directly, indirectly, and through inspiration. Throughout the scripture. So would it be right and exact if I said Allah speaks to you through your hunches, intuitions, and... Um, nope. Yeah, and it's self? Nope, because he gave you self-determination and will. You're controlling your own hunches. Only time Allah is speaking to a person when it's right and exact. Okay. And that is not determined by mortals. That would be, you know, stuff like, you know, um... How many fleas exist in the world? If you got the answer to that, that's Allah speaking. Amen. Till that time, <laughs> the answer is quite simple, you know. Infinite, right? It's always changing. All right. right. Now, um, you said just a few minutes ago that Allah is in heaven, right? I mean, the brother. The scripture Issa, says that. Yes. The brother Issa said that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what heaven is he in? I mean, if there's no such thing as a heaven. All right. In the Arabic language again, we right. have. More than one word for heaven. Right. One word is Sama, and the other one is Samawat. Then right. they have descriptions of the garden, which is Jannah, and several other names. When they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Samawat, they're talking about the galactical, the spiritual essence of Lahut, Malakut, Malaik, and Nasut, and Nasut Insan. The three stages of existence before things personify. The last stage is Nasut, which is the state of insan, Nas, human being, when things become physical. When it's in a state of Lahut, Illahua, in a state of Allah, then it's in a supreme state. When it becomes Malakut, then it becomes a supreme being state. And then when it becomes Nasut, it becomes a human being state. Mm. You see, Allah can reside interchangeably in all of them. But the height of His existence is not cal cal calculated by any measurements or numbers. 
Okay, uh, I have another question. Now, you said that um, I would like to know the difference between Iblis, the devil, and the jinn. Right. Are they all one and the same, or you know, the Turn same? Turn the book to the books of Revelation, chapter twelve. All right, I got it. Now, in twelve seven. Uh huh. What do we read? And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Say it. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That That's one of his names, the great dragon. Go ahead. Re referring to Iblis? Read on, you see it. Oh. That old serpent, which That's is called... That's another one of his names, the serpent. Which is called the devil. That's Iblis. And Satan. See, when they said Satan, they got Shaitan. Right. When they said the devil, they said Iblis. When they said the dragon, they used the word Khanan. Go ahead. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out. And he out. also has angels. Was cast with him, you see it? Yes. So now, here, Iblis, Jinn, or Jan, which it should be as a single, right. Tahut, Khana, and Shaitan is all classified as one being. Mm. The same way, Allah, Arrat, you right. see that? Allah, Arrat, Al Khaliku, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim is all referring to the same being. So it's all one and the same, right? That's right. No, no, that's it. They're all one being. Okay, so, um, it would be wrong to bind partners with Allah, it says in the Quran, right? We can't bind partners. We can't bind partners with Allah. <laughs> Not that it's wrong. We can't. So did Allah choose the physical body to show and prove his, his existence on this physical earth? Allah never takes on a physical body. So Allah doesn't have a physical form. If Allah had a physical form, then Allah would have certain things like a, let's start, a nose. Right. What's a nose for? To smell. What's no. A nose is for breathing. Oh, Things right. do smell. Well, you can use it for smelling. Yeah, you can use it for, you can use it for a boxing glove, but that's not what it's for. It's for, it's for breathing. All right. All right? And what is breathing for? To motivate us. To sustain, sustain life. life. Right, right. Does law need to be sustained in life if he's ever living? No. Eyes. What are eyes for? To see. What is it that Allah does not see? Does he see in the darkness of the light? Yes. And if I took you in a dark room and cut off the light, could you see? Well, wait a minute. We're dealing with the third eye? Well, dealing if with I, two physical eyes. You can deal with the fifth eye. If I took you in a dark room and cut off the light, <laughs> can you see? Yes or no? No, I can't. All right. All right. So a lot doesn't have eyes. He obviously doesn't have a nose because he doesn't need a nose. He doesn't need ears to hear. He doesn't have a heart because he don't need blood pumped to his body. Right. And all of these are signs of submission. Every one of your so-called divine attributes, right. divine, are signs of submission. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So how would it be that in the scriptures it says that the, um, Allah laughs and he grieves at his heart that he made man on the earth as if he was Those man are himself. emotions. Those are not physical attributes. Those are emotions. You ever, you ever, well, if you ever walk up to a newborn baby of your own, Right. That first sensation that makes you want to laugh and cry at the same time is not really described in English language in any dictionary. They have a, they have cry in a dictionary, you know. Yeah. They have laugh. But you, you know that feeling sometimes something is so good and it happens in between? Right. They don't have that one. Try to find that one in a dictionary. The one called, uh, I, think, I think that would be called, uh, what? How would you say laugh and cry at the same time? <laughs> crack? Let me say crack? No. <laughs> <laughs> you follow me? But it does exist. That sense of joy. That comes over a person where they can laugh and cry at the same time, especially kids. kids. Sometimes you beat them and they're crying, and then you start making them laugh, and they be laughing and crying at the exact same time. They don't have that when they cry. That's an emotion. Allah does have emotions because He is El Wudud, the loving. Uh huh. He's the compassionate. He does have love and concern. Uh huh. Okay, go ahead. Well, within the lessons, right? I'm not saying that that you know what you're saying right now is applying to that, but you know, but being that you said that um Allah can't be seen, right? Are you saying that? That he can't be seen? No, nope, I never said he cannot be seen. I, I, you see? Yeah, I, mean, I understand what you're trying to do. But well, you know what I'm saying? Positive, yeah. I understand what you're trying to do. Allah is the ever living. Right. Allah is seen when you see me. And when I see you. And when you see every baby that's born. But you cannot encase Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into any specific object and put him in any place or thing at any given time. Because he is beyond that. He is akbaru. 
So he's beyond that. He's right? Akbaru. <laughs> All right. But then our lessons, it, it states, right? It says that the mind is within everything because the mind gave birth to all things. Now, we see our perception of the mind is similar to how some of the Muslims see Allah as being everywhere at one time. You know, but we feel like this, that the mind is, it is formless, right? And it's on constant motion. The mind takes form. It and when the mind form. takes form, it's called the body. It's called the what? The body. The body is nothing but the mind in form. I breathed into man of my spirit, the Bible says, right. and man became a living soul. A living so it was a thought of the Most High to think something into existence, and it became. So the, your body right. is a physical part of your mind, and it reacts mm -hmm. by what's passing through your mind through thoughts. If you said in your mind, I think I'm going to jump up and down, and then what would you do? Jump up and down. Or change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing everything for the physical. That's why you put ketchup on your french fries. Right. And then a little more salt. Not salt enough. Give me that salt again. You're voluntarily because you're doing everything to please the body. So what's happening while you're in the physical world is you are letting your body rule your mind. Mm -hmm. And if I say, go take that off and start wearing simple white robes every day, and stop brushing the waves in your hair, let your hair, let your hair grow, then you're starting to let your mind dominate your body. We're going to prostrate our body on the ground five. I'm not doing that there. That's submitting my physical body to nature. That's what you have to do. Submit your physical body to the mind. And let your mind rule your body by saying, I don't want to stop and pray five times a day. And no Muslim you know and it does want it. He tells you he's a liar. No Muslim wants to get up and slap a at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and go make wadu and pray. No Muslim wants to do it. So is prayer actually a form of you becoming in tune with the mind once the again? That's right. Prayer is a, the salah in Islam is a way of man dominating his body and giving room for his mind, mental growth. So with Fasting that, is the same thing. Go ahead. So would that be, so would we be wrong if we said that the mind is symbolic to Allah? Mm -hmm. I mean like... Yes, it would be wrong to symbolize Allah into anything because the word symbol is a thing. True. Allah is the breath of life that you're breathing. Breathe yeah. out, breathe it out. And now breathe out and right. grab it. Yeah. Did you get along? Yeah, I got loose. What does it look like? It's formless. See? Stop symbolizing them. You don't have to. When you breathe out, you're letting out the breath of life, but you can't grab it. You can you can hug yourself. <laughs> and the sad thing about it is because the white man has put cast with a friendly ghost on television and yeah. a bunch of he had, he messed this up. Allah is not a spook. Right. He's not no, Allah is not our spirit. Uh -huh. Allah is not the mind. Allah is not the soul. Allah yeah. is not a soul. You see that? Allah yeah. al-hayu. Allah is ever living. <laughs> so can, can, is Allah just this energy, is it the highest self? It's, I mean, but you said it's yes, the degree the nearest, is the highest The self. nearest point of Allah is one of his names, Ru. Ru means the essence. The essence of what? Of all things manifest and unmanifest. See, one of Allah's blinks will take more time than your whole life so you'd never see his eye open again. If you breathed a hundred thousand years, a hundred thousand times, right. right, you still would not have completed one breath of Allah. Mm. That's why we call him Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He is more magnificent than we can even imagine in our minds. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, why would you be up in the city shoveling snow, right. taking in pollution and living next door to drug guys, not necessarily you per se. Uh -huh. Why would you be out there in Queens moving around, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. When you could be living on your own land, raising your own food, and not being subject to the devil at all. Living out on your own property, and raise your own kids, educate them in the own light that you want. Right. Uh, why, why would you, not yourself, because it's not you, it's your family. Uh -huh. Why would they allow themselves to come and be a worm on this apple that we all on? Well, I guess if, since you know in the media it's, it sees as New York as being a land of opportunity and having you know, jobs and things. That's exactly what I said. So in order to prosper a little so bit we, more, they came up here. And we bring our, so we bring ourselves into slavery. Because right. when your grandfather left down there where he was ruling his own farm to come up here to get educated by the white man and get a job in the white man's society, he became the white man's slave. He left his own free land in the Caribbean to come over here to work for the white man. And then when the white man abuses him at work, he's mad, he doesn't realize he put himself in slavery. Hmm. We leave the South and come up to New York to try to be split and then get abused by the white man and then blame the white man. <laughs> and then someone says, let's get together and build our own land, pack up and take our children and get out of this city and away from the devil so we can live our way of life in El Islam. You know many kind of stories and things you hear from Negroes to justify staying up under the white man? And they talk about the white man is abusing us. Right. 
all those churches and Christian churches, they be, all these new Christian preachers preaching about the white man, they be traveling from Georgia up here to talk about the white man. It don't take no more than a Greyhound bus to get back down to Alabama. <laughs> you can get out of slavery as soon as, as soon as you want to. That's what Anselm Law's community is doing. Mm. We're saying, come join us. Get together as black people and let's build for of and by each other to have something for our children, our own farms, our own land, our own sheep, our own cattle, our own air, our own playing grounds, everything ourselves and the heck with the white man. And the white man is so busy trying to keep people satisfied under Michael Jackson and them, they forget you even exist. Mm. And you can go and live the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. You can live by the Quran and they're just professing it and living in a project or living in an apartment or welfare renting from somebody and stealing and borrowing from Bob to, to, to give the owls and living under what they call dog eat dog world. We say come on in and let us build together. We already have the farmland. We already have the property upstate. It's already there. All owned by Muslims. Mm. Muslim families are living up there. We already have the livestock. We have to worry about halal meat. We grow our own goats. Mm. Our own cows. We ain't gonna about food. Because they still waiting for that mystery God to provide for them. That's right, and he ain't coming. He ain't coming. <laughs> he already came, actually, and you. Mm. All right. So there ain't no more mysteries. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم Those are verses 1 through 5 of Salatul Alaq from the Holy Quran chapter Separation of Cells. Now the 96th, originally the first chapter revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Translation by As Sayyid Imam Isa al Hadi Mahdi. And it reads as follows Begin all things with the illustrious names of Allah, the yield of the most merciful. O seal of the prophets of Allah, Muhammad, by the supreme sovereignty of your sustainer and creator. You are being ordered to read by beginning with the name of your illustrious sustainer who created all things. He, Allah, created all human beings of a separating self. So read because your sustainer, Allah, is most generous. He uses the quill to teach. He, Allah, taught human beings what they would have never known. You have been listening to The True Light with as Sayyid Al-Imam Isa al Hadi Mahdi. The Nubian Islamic Hebrew Mission would like you to write or send questions to True Light, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 